Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Elliott Unitarian Chapel, where we are committed to courageous love, growing in spirit, and compassionate action. I'm Reverend Krista Taves. I'm the Minister of Congregational Life here at Elliott Chapel, and I have the privilege of serving you. In this beloved community, all are welcome in the fullness of our age, race, culture, ability, gender identity, sexual orientation, and religious experience. If you've made your way to us in our first live Zoom Sunday service, congratulations. It is so good to see all of you here. Whether this is your first time worshiping with a Unitarian congregation, or you've been a Unitarian Universalist so long, you've lost count of the years, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope that this hour will be a renewing time for you. If you are visiting us for the first time, I do hope you'll let us know you're here. There is a link on the front page of our website, elliotchapel.org, which you can fill in so that we can stay connected after this service. I hope that you will finish this hour with us, curious to know more. So let's start our service. I am very excited that the Bay Area Unitarian Universalist Church Choir from Houston, Texas, was very pleased to give us permission to share one of their videos. Give us hope. In the Unitarian Universalist tradition, we light a chalice to symbolize that we have entered sacred space. The chalice represents beloved community. The flame symbolizes the spirit of life that burns in each one of us 
and in all things. Francis Beecher and Janelle Berger are lighting our chalice today. Fire consumes and it casts a bright light. May our chalice flame consume our regrets from the past, our fears about the future, and our worries about today. May it cast for us a path of joy and peace. Thank you. Please join with me in singing our opening hymn, Wo Ya Ya. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will, it will be hard, we know. I would invite you to join with me in the spirit of prayer and meditation as you are willing and able. Our prayer this morning was written by author Donna Markova. May I, may you, may we not die unlived lives. May none of us live in fear of falling or catching fire. May we choose to inhabit our days to allow our living to open us, to make us less afraid, more accessible, to loosen our hearts until they become wings, torches, promises. May each of us choose to risk our significance, to live so that which comes to us as seed goes to the next as blossom, and that which comes to us as blossom goes on as fruit. Let us enter into a time of silence for the thoughts and prayers of our hearts. For all that is in our hearts, minds, and spirits, we offer love and give thanks. Amen and blessed be. Our offertory this morning is being introduced by Betsy Comfort. Good morning. I've been a member of LA Chapel since 2014, and I serve on the Social Justice Action Team, which chooses the organization we share our collection plate with. This month, we are sharing our offering with Kirkwood Area Every Child Promise, or Ketchup, which is spelled like the red stuff we put on our hot dogs. Ketchup was created after a racial equity report for the school district said that if we want to achieve equity, it has to start with early childhood. 
Catch Up works with our community's youngest learners and their families to ensure that they get the start they need. It helps with scholarships, community resources, Promise Place, a clothing and supply closet, and it partners with Kirk Care, Parents as Teachers, Kirkwood Public Library, Magic House, Faith Organizations, the School District, and businesses to provide holistic support for children and their families. As we know, many nonprofits are experiencing lower levels of giving since March, and families that struggled before the pandemic are struggling even more. So our support means a lot. Please be as generous as you can. There are instructions for giving on the screen. Thank you, Betsy. Our reading this morning is by Reverend Gretchen Haley, who we saw last week when we visited the Foothills congregation. This is what she writes about surrender, which is our topic today. Give up the fight for some other moment, some other life than here and now. Give up the longing for some other world, the wishing for other choices to make, other bodies to sing, other bodies, other ages, other countries, other stakes. Purge the past, forgive the future, for each come too soon. Surrender only to this life, this day, this hour, not because it does not constantly break your heart, but because it also beckons with beauty, startles with delight. If only we keep waking up. This is the gift we have been given. These body clothes, this heartbreak, this pulse, this breath, this light, these friends, this hope. Here we remember ourselves, all a part of it, giving thanks together. So, one of the things that I'm missing the most about our online reality is that we can't sing together. We can't rise our voices in song and hear each other around us. Zoom is a terrible, terrible platform for group singing. However, what we can do is create motion together. So this next song is one that some of you called, uh, no, it's called There is a Love um, by Rebecca Parker and Elizabeth Norton. And um, we're going to do hand movements with it together. And so we won't be singing together, but we will still be creating music together. So I'm going to show you the hand signals. They're very, very simple. And then we'll start the song and we are going to create music together. So this is how it goes. Okay. So follow me. Get your hands ready. Okay. There is a love holding me 
there is a love holding all that I love. There is a love holding all. I rest in this love, rest in love. And then the next song replaces I and me with we and us. Okay, there is a love holding us. There is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all. We rest in this love, rest in love. Okay? All right, let's start the music. All right, ready? There is a love holding me. There is a love holding all that I love. There is a love holding all I rest in. This love rest in. so beautiful to see us doing something together live in real time what a blessing one of the things i love about unitarian universalism is that we are passionate about service our faith has never been just about what we believe in fact, we fervently believe that it is not enough for a church to simply proclaim what we believe about God or the universe or an afterlife. It is much more important that we focus on how we live and how we act. This is why our theology engages in a holy restlessness, because we have such a profound vision of how things could be if we truly lived in right relationship, that when we see the gap between what is and what should be, we just want to do something to stop the suffering and harm that comes from the deep brokenness of this world and to be there 
for the mending. We have this deep conviction that we are called to tear down the hells of this world and restore the heaven of beloved community. And all of this is wrapped up in our understanding of humanity, not as depraved or inherently sinful, but that we are born, every one of us, with a deep, glowing spark of love. The kind of love that is so powerful that it holds all of us and blesses us with the capacity to create goodness. Everything we do in Unitarian Universalism is about channeling that love. And that's a pretty powerful theology. And it's one of the ways that Unitarian Universalism helps us to find new life, new energy, and hope. But sometimes, sometimes I have found that there's something missing in how we live this faith as action. Sometimes we are so focused on the goal so focused on what could be or should be and how important it is to get there that we become detached from the present moment. And this isn't unique to Unitarian Universalism. Our culture is a goal-driven culture. We are addicted to success, addicted to statistics, rankings, accomplishments, productivity. We measure each other and ourselves constantly and sometimes we Unitarian Universalists also measure ourselves relent, rel, unrelentingly. We aren't doing enough. We aren't being enough. We aren't caring enough. We aren't giving enough. And more and more, I wonder, I really wonder about how we take care of ourselves and each other when we ourselves are broken by the brokenness that we yearn to end. One of the larger stories we tell in our society is that those who are broken are morally weak and that they did it to themselves. And even though intellectually, most of us know this really isn't true and that in fact, it is pretty abusive. Many of us do have that voice in our head saying, come on, be more, pull yourselves up. You should do better. And I'm no exception. There was a time in my life when I was truly disillusioned and filled with heartbreak. And what caused it is less important than the fact that it happened. So I went to church on one Sunday when things were particularly hard, looking for comfort. And the sermon was one of those biography sermons of someone who did great things and overcame incredible odds. Many of us who have been around Unitarian Universalism for a while have certainly heard a version of this sermon. I've given a sermon like this myself many times, offering someone as a model of how to live well and justly. But on that Sunday, it fell far short of what my spirit needed because the call to be strong and keep pushing forward of muscling my way into hope just made me feel not good enough. So I turned to the closest thing we Unitarian Universalists have, a have to a Bible, which is our gray hymnal, and started looking for comfort. And most of the hymns were like that sermon. They proclaimed hope, encouraged us to strive for victory, to anchor in our power and work towards justice, which is as it should be. But I only found one hymn that gave me permission to feel lost and small. Maybe you know this hymn. Sing it with me. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home. A long way from home. 
What is significant about this hymn is that it is one of the few in our gray hymnal from the African-American tradition, from a communal history that often experiences powerlessness. There is no fight in this song, but rather a bittersweet surrender and vulnerability. And you can see that many of the other songs in our hymnal are written by people who are in positions different in our society, positions of power, perhaps positions of privilege where our identity gives us a different place and different access to power. And a lot of our hymns about empowerment, when you look at them closely, are about the singer offering comfort and help to those out there who are suffering. The suffering is removed rather than up close. And this is one of the reasons why we often say that even our beautiful Unitarian Universalist faith emerged from a culture of white supremacy because it assumes access to power. And that's one of the things we're really working to change. And that's why, because it, 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 uh, it puts people on the outside who are in those places of weakness and lack of power. And I began to wonder in my moment of weakness and lack of power, if Unitarian Universalism was only for the strong, only for the moments when you are in your power, what about those moments that invite you not into some fight, but into a place where the most powerful thing is to surrender to what is inside you and around you? The answer, of course, is, is really no. No, you don't always have to be strong and in your center of power to be a Unitarian Universalist. But I do think that in our very optimistic and forward-looking faith, where we often focus so much on what we should be doing, we can reflect on how we could respond with more compassion in times of weakness, when we are wrapped in shadow, when we lose our power, when we lose our faith or are faced by those things that are so much bigger than us that we are rendered powerless. Sometimes it's not the time to gather our energy and prepare to fight. Sometimes it is time to surrender, to come into a place of acceptance and to let it be, trusting that we will be held by that greater love which knows no limits even as we face limits all around us. I want to tell you about a time when I had to learn to surrender. Three years ago, with no warning, my eldest and closest brother was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. My mom flew out right away. My partner and I followed closely behind, and my dad arrived shortly after. And by the time we had all arrived, the prognosis was in. No cure. He might have a year. And as is so common in the face of terrible news, we all went into doing something. It was easier to write lists and assign responsibilities than to sit in the reality of what was happening. It helped us to feel like we had some control over something. And it was decided that we would take shifts staying with him and his wife. And I was first. My job was to drive him for his treatments, a four hour round trip from his farm in, in, into Edmonton, Alberta. We left as the sun rose and got home as it was setting. They were very long days. Our whole lives were shaped by his medications, his treatments, his sleep schedule, and every symptom and side effect. Now, I have to tell you that where my brother lived was stunningly beautiful. You could literally see for miles around, not a house or road in sight, just the high prairie sky and the grasses that never stopped bending and the wind that never ceased blowing. And one morning, as we were loading up to leave for Edmonton, the sun was just rising and the black sky was pierced with layers of blue and orange. And I drew in my breath and I said, oh, Martin, 
you live in paradise. And he said, yes, I do. This is where I am most alive. And in that moment, we took a break from fighting cancer, a fight that we were going to lose anyway, and received this sunrise that would happen whether we were watching it or not. And the prairie around us with those winds that never stopped and the sky that was so high, we were so small compared to the majesty. And perhaps that is why my brother insisted on spending as much time as he could outside. Because before the expansiveness of the prairie, what does one shortened life mean? To be part of the prairie is to surrender any illusion of your own power before it. It didn't make his impending death less tragic or less painful, but it did put it in perspective. And it gave us all some room to breathe. So what is this thing called surrender? Surrender happens when you let go of some attachment to something that is beyond your control. And you come to an acceptance of what is and can even see the beauty in it. Surrender is not easy because it usually involves issues of identity, power, and freedom. So for example, if you have had the experience of wanting someone you care about to be a certain way, and you keep striving for them to be the person you want them to be, surrender is when you accept that you really have no power to change them. They are who they are. And once you've surrendered to that, you can make choices for yourself that weren't possible before. You've given up the illusion that was taking all of your energy and now you're free. Another example, I've heard dear ones tell me about their journeys with mental illness and how they strive to live in what they think must be normal ways and how this ends up really hurting. Once you surrender to the power of the mental illness, you can make decisions about who you are with the mental illness rather than who you are trying to be fighting it. I've come to believe that the spiritual practice of surrender, while it feels like you're giving up control, actually gives a whole lot of control back. And I've also come to believe that the spiritual practice of surrender is what could get us through this pandemic, and maybe even through this election. What do we have to surrender at this time? Let's start first with the pandemic. That's actually the easier one, I think, because here we're just talking about science and how we respond to what we're learning. We can give up the illusion that only we and our closest ones are affected by our choices. We can give up the illusion that no matter how strong you think your body is, you really can't know if you would survive if you got COVID. We're being asked to surrender to the possibility that even if we feel perfectly well, we might be carrying the disease and could kill someone if we infect them. We can surrender as well to the times when we become overwhelmed because this pandemic is really asking a lot of us. And we're overwhelmed not because we are weak or not resilient enough, but because this pandemic is messing with us. Who among us is really strong enough to just sail through this? I'm also thinking a lot about what the practice of surrender can offer us as we close in on the November election. Anxiety is very high. Many of us are going to work exceptionally hard to get the results that we are desperate for. We are gonna give money and time. Some of us are gonna volunteer for candidates and issues as much as we can. Many of us are going to Facebook and we're gonna share and we're gonna retweet way too many memes. And every one of us who can is gonna vote by whatever means are available to us. And we're gonna help other people to vote. 
So we're building up the energy we need to get through these months. We are going to need to be very strong and advocate ceaselessly for our core values of justice, equity, and compassion. But this is what is out of our control. We know that outrageous, hurtful things are going to be done and said by those who fear defeat. It is already a mean and dirty election campaign, and new lows are being hit on a daily level. This is out of our control. This is what else is out of our control. What happens between every voter and the ballot before them? We have no power over what they choose in that moment where you're holding that pen and you're filling in your choices. Now, we can certainly try to bend this nation towards justice, and we must, but ultimately, there will be a time to close the checkbook, to put down the phone, to lay down the newspaper, and to breathe deeply and wait. So my question for you is this, is there something in your life that is asking for surrender, asking for you to let go and accept what is? What are you afraid might happen if you do let go? What do you hope for if you surrender to this thing that is bigger than you? I started this message asking whether Unitarian Universalism is only for the strong. Absolutely not. But I do believe that the spiritual path of Unitarian Universalism does make us stronger and that there are many paths to strength. Sometimes pushing forward is the strength that is called for. But sometimes surrender is what releases the strength that we are needing. And by grounding in our principles, by anchoring in that love that holds everything, we will know what we are called to do. So let's think about this. What do we need to surrender? How will it open up the strength that we need for ourselves, for our loved ones, and for this beautiful and hurting world? Amen and blessed be. Our closing hymn is one of our favorites. It's one of my favorites, Blue Boat Home.
Thank you so much for being here today. It's been so nice to see all your faces and to be with you in this time of worship. We're going to take a short break and then coffee hour will be right back here in this Zoom room at our normal time at 11.30 a.m. Janelle and Francis, would you please extinguish our chalice? May the spirit of life and love be with you and yours and in your heart, mind, and spirit from this day until we meet again. Love to you all. Be well, stay safe, and see you soon.